and then just share it with you. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in another session of Fusion Breakthroughs. I'm Matteo Barbarino for the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I'm here today with my colleague Joanne Liu from the IAA Office of Public Information and Communication. Hi, I'm Joanne, and I am a writer and editor for, at the IAEA, also co-host of the podcast Nuclear Explained. So if you have a chance, we recently did a podcast on fusion energy, if you'd like to check it out. Thank you, Joanne. So in this special episode uh, today, experts from the US DOE Lawrence Livermore National Lab, the National Ignition Facility, will present results from the historic fusion breakthrough, which was announced on December 13, 2022 scientific energy gain for the first time in a fusion experiment. Extraordinary. So scientists at the NIF ignited a fusion reaction and produced about 3.15 megajoule of energy from 2.05 megajoule energy output of the 192 lasers, an effort that achieved net energy for the first time in a fusion experiment. So many thanks to our guests today and for their availability. We have Omar, Dr. Omar Hurricane, Chief Scientist for the Inertial Confinement Fusion Program Design and Physics Division. Dr. Jean-Michel De Nicola, Chief Engineer for the NIF Laser System. Dr. Annie Kritcher, Principal Designer and Team Lead for the Integrated Modeling, for Integrated Modeling. Uh, Dr. Abbas Nikro, Target Fabrication Program Manager. Dr. Dave Schlossberg, Science Lead, uh, NIF Nuclear Diagnostics. Dr. Bruno Van Bor Vontergem, NIF Operations <laughs> Manager, and Dr. Alex Zilstra, the Principal Experimentalist. So the format of today will be a little bit different than what we have at what we had usually. There will be one talk, so we'll begin with one talk from Dr. Hurricane on how ignition and target gain larger than one was achieved in inertial fusion, and then we'll go into a Q&A panel discussion, uh, which will be moderated by Joanne Liu. Please type your questions and comment to the chat box during the technical talk, and we will go through your questions at the end. I would like to ask to the other panelists to mute, make sure they're on mute and to turn off their videos while we go through the first talk. So uh, Omar, thank you for being here and uh, I hand it over to you. Super, thank you very much for the introduction. I'll get right into it. So uh, our recent ICF experiments on the NIF are an existence proof of laboratory ignition and target gain, uh, and that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, no physics mystery, obstacles uh, apparently stand in the way of ignition, uh, and that's what we mean by an existence proof. What we mean, we mean by ignition is the explosive thermodynamic instability uh, of the uh, fusion plasma, and by gain, uh, we mean uh, energy out greater than energy in. Uh, what's really exciting is the theoretical prediction of the physics parameter regime, uh, and I'm referring to the loss and triple product where ignition was expected to occur is actually consistent with our results, uh, and that's why there's no apparent mystery in getting to ignition. Uh, additional energy at fixed laser power, uh, laser power was, a, was very beneficial. Uh, the implosion physics uh, was more sensitive to engineering control of the laser targets than originally thought. And so far, uh, very high gain, high compression targets have not worked as expected, which, which actually was a big frustration for us and forced us into a different strategy. And all the breakthroughs, which we're going to talk about in this talk over the past decade, have actually used uh, low gain designs. But in the end, uh, the, the last bullet here, which is the uh, remarkable takeaway, is that we can now talk about burning plasmas, uh, ignition, and scientific break even in the past tense. And that's, that's, that's exciting. Okay, so in order to get uh, high fusion yields, uh, we, what we need to do uh, in, in ICF is assemble our fusion fuel into a configuration that can stop alpha particles in the fusion plasma. We're aiming for a, a configuration that looks like this image over on the right, where we have a, a, a cold assembly a shell, a spherical assembly of cold fuel in a shell, that's the blue uh, uh, DT. And uh, in the center of that, we have a hot spot of uh, a hot DT. And what we are trying to do is implement the, the DT fusion reaction, which combines deuterium and tritium, 
uh, to produce a neutron and alpha particle. The neutron carries 80% of the energy. The alpha particle carries about 20% of the energy. And we're, we're trying to capitalize on the fact that the refusion reaction rate shows in blue increases the function of temperature. So if we can get this configuration and stop say 70 to 80 percent of the alpha particles from the DT fusion in this hot spot. By stopping those alpha particles, we get their energy, we get their heat. So when we get their energy and heat, uh, that causes the temperature to go up. Because of the nature of the DT fusion reaction rate increasing, if the temperature goes up, we get more reactions. If we get more reactions, we get more alpha particles and we can stop more of those alpha particles in the hot spot. We get yet more heat out and we get the temperature to go up again. And by doing this process essentially repeatedly, we get what's called self-heating. And if it is intense enough, we get ignition. The conditions that we need uh, for this to occur are a hotspot aerial density, which is a product of density times radius of 0.3 grams per centimeter squared, a peak central density of about 100 grams per centimeter, uh, centimeter cubed or more, and a central pressure of over 400 gigabars, which is over twice the pressure at the center of the tum, at the center of the sun. So if these uh, conditions are met, we get a thermal feedback loop, which is what is described here, and ignition is generated. So the way we create that assembly of fusion fuel uh, is to use what we call indirect drive inertial confinement fusion, which is illustrated in this cartoon here, where we use X-rays to accelerate and uh, ablate, uh, to ablate and accelerate a capsule of fusion fuel to extreme velocity. So here is an example target configuration. Our fuel capsule is the center object. The exterior object here is a HALROM. It's a high Z metal can. Uh, laser beams uh, enter uh, through the top and bottom of that metal can through uh, apertures that we call the laser entrance hole and deposit energy on the inside of the hall room. Those uh, laser beams are absorbed by the inner surface of that hall room wall and they're converted to a bath of x-rays and that heats uh, the environment inside the hall room much like an oven, except in this case it's an x-ray oven. Those intense, that intense bath of x-rays causes the surface of the capsule to explode because it ionizes and it explodes with a pressure of about 150 megabars, 150 million atmospheres of pressure. And that crushes the capsule inwards upon itself and accelerates it to high velocity uh, of order uh, 300 to 400 kilometers per second. We call that stage uh, the implosion. That kinetic energy, uh, when the implosion actually runs out of anywhere to go because the volume is shrinking, uh, as it accelerates inwards, eventually it runs out of anywhere to go and that kinetic energy from the acceleration is converted into internal energy and we call that stagnation. Uh, and if the conditions are right, again, uh, we can get uh, ignition and it, to make this all work, it requires incredibly precise control of the design of the laser and of the target physics parameters. So a lot of, uh, of uh, finesse goes into making this work. So, uh, Let's cover some terms real quick because uh, the terms burning plasma, ignition, and gain all actually mean something physically different, yet the terms are often misunderstood and conflated. So for the purposes of this talk and many of our publications, these are the definitions we use. So a burning plasma, for ICF, a burning plasma occurs when the self-heating that I described earlier exceeds the PDV work coming from this implosion process that heats and compresses the DT. This is very much analogous to the magnetic fusion definition where for magnetic fusion, a burning plasma is one where the self-heating exceeds all external heating of the DT. The difference between ICF and MFE is that while MFE has multiple ways of heating the plasma and ICF, we just have one, the PDV work of the implosion. Uh, ignition, uh, by ignition we, we, we refer to the, the Lawson criteria and this is uh, a condition where the self-heating power exceeds all the DT plasma power losses. That's the condition that sets up the plasma to have this thermodynamic instability. Uh, the losses that the plasma are competing against or the heating is competing against are radiative losses, electron heat conduction, and negative PDD work where the implosion actually becomes an explosion and that sucks energy out. Uh, but if, if the loss in criteria is achieved and a quote ignition is achieved, you get thermodynamic instability, which uh, by that we mean we get an explosive increase in temperature and fusion yield generation. Tar target gain is a separate idea. Uh, 
it stands for uh, when the fusion yield exceeds the laser energy into the target. Now, unfortunately, uh, the national, uh, the 1997 National Academy of Sciences Committee that reviewed uh, the the uh, proposals uh, for NIF construction actually used target gain as the definition of ignition in their report, and that was later adopted by, by the Department of Energy. So uh, that didn't help with this conflation. So when you look at official documents, just be aware, they're actually referring to target gain and calling that ignition. But for us, uh, we have this distinction that I outline here. Okay, so here's the National Ignition Facility. It's a uh, remarkable piece of technology. It's about the size of three football fields in length and, and, and width. It, so it's a gigantic facility. What you're looking at here in the schematic, uh, you're looking at capacitor banks on each side uh, where most of the energy enters the system. And uh, we store, you know, 300 to 400 megajoules of electrical energy in those capacitor banks to drive any given experiment. That on each side of the facility are laser bays of uh, 96 laser beams on each side, uh, a set of preamplifiers at the uh, top end here, and the main laser uh, uh, beam lines are at the lower end. This configuration down here on the lower right is what's called the switchyard, which has mirrors in it that deflect uh, the laser energy into the target chamber, which is shown on the right. Okay, so the NIF actually delivers a frequency tripled 3 omega light into the target chamber. So that 300 to 400 megajoules of electrical energy that goes into the capacitor banks gets turned into 3 megajoules of red light. And just before entering the target chamber, that red light uh, go passes through what's called a tripler which converts the one omega frequency red light into three omega frequency uh, blue light. That two, uh, the blue light actually comes out as two megajoules, not three megajoules, because it's not a perfectly efficient uh, tripler. Uh, so we, we uh, inject two megajoules of blue light into the hall room, uh, which is shown here on the right uh, with a person's fingers to give you an idea of the scale. It's about one centimeter in length. Uh, roughly speaking, that uh, two megajoules of blue light that enters the hall ROM is converted to, into X-rays, as I mentioned a moment ago. But again, that process is not 100% efficient. So only about 200 to 250 kilojoules of that energy is converted into X-rays and is absorbed by the capsule, which is shown here on the lower right. Again, with a person's finger for scale, the capsule is about two millimeters in diameter. Because that capsule ablates, uh, most of that capsule is turned into plasma. So very little of that 250 kilojoules of X-ray energy actually gets into the DT fusion fuel in the center of the capsule. Uh, so there's an extreme loss of energy uh, going from several hundred megajoules to 20 kilojoules before the fusion fuel even sees that. And well, why do we do this? Well, the whole process of inertial fusion is to sacrifice energy, knowingly sacrifice energy for energy density. So that, that's the way inertial confinement fusion works. But the result of that is most of the energy is lost before the fuel sees it. Because there's such a large loss of energy uh, from the beginning of the laser system to what the fusion fuel sees, that actually leads to several energy gain metrics uh, that are relevant for ICF. And they're illustrated uh, in an equation form in the diagram on the right. Uh, again, we have our hall ROM with our capsule inside. And inside the capsule is the fusion fuel. So you can, design, you can define uh, measures of yield out compared to energy in for different layers of this system. So the target uh, gain is defined as the fusion yield fusion yield divided by the energy deposited into the hall ROM by the laser, and it basically represents the energy in and out of this largest volume. The capsule gain is the fusion ener energy out uh, compared to the energy absorbed into the capsule, so it's basically uh, this volume here. And then finally, inside, you can define a fusion uh, fuel gain, which is the yield over the energy that actually made it into the fusion fuel. So in the plot on the left, you see a plot of uh, fuel gain as a function of a complicated parameter that involves the plasma pressure inferred from the experiment, the confinement time, which is the tau, the temperature, the time average temperature from the experiment to a funny power, 
and uh, an inference of the energy that was put into the fusion fuel versus the fusion hotspot. So if you plot things along this parameter, basically all our data falls on one curve, which are the gray points going from the lower left to the lower right. The key takeaway here is that over the last 10 years, we've had a 5,000 times increase in uh, fusion fuel gain uh, from where we started back in uh, 2012 at the end of the National Ignition Campaign, uh, back at the beginning of the National Ignition Campaign until now, or just last month. And that, that's quite a remarkable uh, set of achievements. Uh, but again, yeah, because they're different layers of the target, again, there are different fuel, uh, there are different gain metrics. The fuel gain metric was actually passed in 2014. The capsule gain metric was passed in mid-2021. The target gain was the most recent result in 2022. So after 10 years, as of December 5th, 2022, we have a target gain of about one and a half, uh, which is also what we refer to as scientific break-even, a capsule gain of 12, and a fuel gain of 160. Now, when you talk about gains, it's important to remember that even having a target gain greater than one is not net energy because that doesn't account for the energy used by the facility. It only includes the energy injected into the target. So keep that in mind. All right, so how did we, we do this? Well, it, it was actually a lot of work to get things working correctly. There are many processes that frustrated our process, our progress. Uh, the key uh, processes that frustrated us are illustrated here. Uh, we had instability control problems, symmetry control problems. Uh, we had an issue with getting sufficient energy coupling to our system, to our target. We had target quality problems, and we uh, continue to have problems with achieving ultra-high compression, which forced us into a new strategy. So uh, the way we control some of those issues is through what's called the laser pulse shape. And this has been understood for a while. Uh, we inject a laser, a temporal, a designed temporal laser pulse into the hall ROM, which is shown in blue. So this is uh, laser power versus time uh, shown on the left. That is converted into X-rays in the hall ROM, which is the red curve uh, shown on the left. And by designing uh, the temporal profile in time of the laser pulse, we can control key elements of our our target physics performance and i'm just highlighting a few here uh, also to get you familiar with some of our jargon so this early part of the laser pulse we call the foot and what the foot does is it actually controls the stability and the majority of the fuel entropy uh, which we sometimes call the adiabat a measure of that is the adiabat uh, alpha if which stands for alpha in flight or adiabat in flight we have the peak power part of the laser pulse that actually tends to control the velocity of our implosion. And since kinetic energy, as you'll see, is important to us, uh, that peak power is important. And then finally, this last part of the laser pulse, we call that the coast period or the coast time. And it turns out that seems to be key to controlling the efficiency of the conversion of kinetic energy into DT internal energy in our implosions. And it's uh, linked to uh, something we call the radius of peak velocity, which is where the implosion acquires uh, its peak velocity. The reason why this pulse shape has influence over the performance of the implosion is because the implosion is driven by this pressure on the outside called ablation pressure, and the ablation pressure is related to the radiation temperature of the hall room, which is the red curve. So it responds to that, and it also depends on what the material of the capsule is made out of through the, uh, the Z, the uh, atomic, um, number, the atomic weight, and uh, the albedo, the, the way the, uh, the ablator responds to that bath of x-rays. So that's how we, we uh, have some chance of controlling some of the properties of the implosion. Okay, so where did we start? Well, back in 2010, 2012, we were using a plastic ablator, what we called low foot implosion. So that early part of the laser pulse was, was quote, low. And that was designed that way to have a low adiabat and very high compression. Uh, they were intended to produce high yield, but those implosions actually underperformed for many reasons. So we'll be going through a set of plots uh, like this where I'm showing you neutron yield in the number, a total number of fusion neutrons on the left uh, plot versus uh, DD ion temperature on the x-axis. And on the right plot, I'm just showing basically the same fusion yield except converted into energy units rather than neutron number 
just so uh, one of those uh, might give you a, a better feel for what's going on. Uh, and this fusion yield on the right plot is plotted versus the inferred hotspot pressure, which is in gigabars, which is billions of atmospheres. Okay, so these these implosions uh, implo uh, <laughs> produced much less than one megajoule of energy. Uh, they didn't seem to have as much of a pattern in their behavior as was desired, so there were definitely some problems associated with them that had to be sorted out. One of the key problems, which was hypothesized at that time and ended up being uh, proven later, was that hydrodynamic instability was, uh, was really problematic for those implosions. And it's going to be illustrated by this, uh, this movie here, which I'll show in a moment. But basically, this is the process where uh, small perturbations in the, in the uh, surface of the capsule are growing exponentially in time. Uh, under these enormous accelerations that an ICF implosion uh, undergoes. So there's a uh, example uh, analytic uh, formula which expresses this instability process. This is the uh, growth rate for the instability. It goes at the square root of the wave number, the acceleration, uh, and that's what we call Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Uh, it's mitigated somewhat by uh, density gradients and ablation velocity. There are numerous forms of this equation, but when you have a positive growth rate, again, small perturbations in the surface become exponentially large in time, and that will be illustrated by this movie here. So while obviously we want to have like a shell of high density material uh, around a hot central hot spot, but when you have a lot of instability, the implosion tends to want to turn itself inside out and, and you never, you, you defeat the hot spot in the middle and the shell of material on the outside is basically torn to pieces. Uh, now, of course, we need to get high velocities, so that means high accelerations, but that's destabilizing. So the only way to really fight against that is to try to increase uh, the density gradients and to increase the ablation velocity with an increased temperature in the hall rom. To, to mitigate uh, the growth rate of the instability. And those ideas led to the high foot implosion. So the high foot implosion is one where we impl that we implemented in the 2013 to 2015 time scale. And like the name says, we just raised the, the, uh, the power in that part of the laser pulse called the foot uh, to increase the stabilizing influence of ablative Rayleigh-Taylor uh, of ablation and of the uh, density gradients in that uh, blade of Rayleigh-Taylor uh, formula. That actually seemed to work. We improved the uh, performance by about an order of magnitude, and we were able to increase the pressure by a factor of three uh, in those implosions. And it allowed us to explore other behavior uh, and learn uh, what else might be frustrating the performance of our ICF uh, implosions. So while these uh, high foot implosions actually increased the fusion yield by a factor of 10, uh, they also had repeatable behavior by uh, controlling uh, instability better. But we saw that uh, symmetry control was still an issue. So here's a set of experiments, and uh, there, there are two sets of experiments shown here. Uh, the first three are lower power, lower energy experiments where we start with a baseline shot and we do a couple of repeats, and then we have a set of experiments we are already doing where we are using higher laser power and higher energy to get higher implosion velocities. Again, we have a baseline shot and then we do a couple of repeats. And here's an example of the repeatability of these old high foot experiments. In a qualitative sense, the, uh, the you can see the symmetry. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is X-ray emission, so you're seeing the hot spot emission. Uh, from peak compression uh, on this first row. The second row, you're seeing neutron emission, the uh, the 14 uh, MeV neutrons are the red, and the downscattered uh, lower energy neutrons are the blue. So that gives you some sense of the hot spot and the cold fuel around the hot spot. Fusion yield is shown on the lower uh, call, uh, lower row and the DT ion temperature is also shown on the lower row to give you an idea of the repeatability. repeatability. So uh, we get a, a fair degree of repeatability in the shape of the implosions, a good degree of repeatability in the yield and the temperature, except for one shot where the, the laser misfired and it underperformed. So by having a fairly repeatable implosion, because we mitigated uh, 
instability to some degree. Uh, we could then do studies on some other processes. One of the things we wanted to study is the late time part of that laser pulse, uh, which again we called the coast time period. So what we did in a series of experiments is we tested higher power, shorter duration uh, laser pulses versus lower power, longer duration laser pulses conserving total laser energy. And again, that's compared to a baseline shot in blue. Uh, you can actually have the same implosion velocity uh, when you change the uh, the peak power uh, in this way. So you can take implosion velocity out of the equation and just see what the late time uh, behavior of the laser pulse does to the implosion. As you can see, the red curve, which is the one where we kept the laser power lower, but extended the duration of laser power, leads to an extended duration of radiation temperature at late time in the hall room. That ends up being key because of the ablation pressure uh, formula I showed earlier. So in the end, when we did a whole series of experiments, this is a plot of pressure versus coast time, we found that by reducing the coast time, we got a very uh, rapid increase in, in uh, stagnation pressure in our implosion which helps us with our uh, loss in uh, criteria uh, metric. And in fact, we later understood the, uh, the physics behind this uh, by understanding that this very late period of increased uh, laser energy and radiation temperature uh, forces the implosion to acquire its peak velocity at a smaller radius. We call that the radius of peak velocity, and that ends up being key to increasing the stagnation pressure and other quantities that are important for fusion to occur. All right, so with that knowledge, we move forward uh, to a new set of experiments that were meant to address the asymmetry problems we saw in those earlier plastic implosion uh, designs. We switched uh, to a blader material from plastic to high density carbon. Uh, the reason why that ends up being key is high density carbon uh, has a density of about three times that of plastic. If you have a density uh, that's three times higher, you can make the thickness of the ablator uh, three times thinner, and that allows you to use uh, shorter laser pulses. And they were, we were already suspecting that the length of the laser pulse uh, was a serious issue for our symmetry control. Those uh, implosions performed quite well. We were able to push up the temperature and yield uh, by about a factor of uh, uh, two in yield as compared to the high foot implosions. We we're able to push the ablation pressure up almost by a factor of uh, the ablation pressure, the uh, hot spot pressure up by about a factor of two compared to the high foot implosions. Uh, but we still weren't igniting. Uh, we were, were only about a factor of two higher in yield than the, uh, the high foot, and it's still orders of magnitude uh, below what needed to ignite. So it turns out, even though we had made a lot of improvements on the symmetry control, it was still frustrating. Symmetry control actually is still challenging even today. And this is an illustration of some um, asymmetries that are occur in, in our implosions. The uh, data uh, from uh, fluence compensated downscattered images on the top, synthetic images from simulations on the bottom, and uh, simulations of what the density looked like on the bottom. So this is just uh, kind of a zoology of different asymmetries that can occur. Now, why was uh, symmetry uh, so important to uh, getting these uh, fusion implosions to perform correctly? The reason actually comes down to energy. In ICF, it's actually essential to maximize the conversion of implosion kinetic energy into hotspot energy. We saw this in our database. So on the left plot, you see total fusion yield plotted versus hotspot internal energy. And you can see this is a log scale here, but we get an increase in fusion yield as we increase the energy deposited into the hotspot and the, the scaling goes as energy to the 3.3 power. They're scatter uh, in the data because of things we can't control as well. Again, the symmetry and the target quality, but uh, essentially we, we knew that uh, hotspot internal energy was important to getting higher uh, fusion yields. But when you look at uh, simulations and uh, a lot of work that's gone back over many decades, symmetry always seemed to degrade uh, the, uh, the fusion yield if you had any. So if you had increased asymmetry, the yields would go down. If you had decreased asymmetries, the yield would go up. 
and uh, simulations had shown that for a long time. You can put those two things together and you uh, see that the, the net energy uh, that goes to the hot spot is a, is a combination of the kinetic energy of the implosion, just from freshman physics, the one half mv squared uh, uh, that the implosion acquires, uh, but it's degraded by uh, a factor related to a measure of uh, asymmetry, which we tend to term uh, uh, normalized RKE, uh, and RKE uh, will stand for re residual kinetic energy. So uh, this principal observation led to something we call the hybrid strategy. We realized, well, we're going to be stuck with controlling asymmetry imperfectly and other parts of our implosion imperfectly. Let's just try to maximize the energy that we can get to the hot spot. We were already pushing our implosions to very high implosion velocity, so we didn't think we could squeeze much out of that, much more out of velocity because we might uh, start having stability control problems again. So that caused us to focus on the mass of the shell. Let's just make the shell of the implosion bigger. You can make it bigger by making the radius bigger. You can make it bigger by making it thicker uh, and so on. And and so uh, that led to a, a strategy we called the high yield, big radius implosion design. And uh, we moved on from there. So before we move on, let's talk about the physics of asymmetry because that's kind of interesting. Uh, you can actually understand why symmetry control is important using a basic uh, kind of a freshman physics model. And the way you can understand why symmetry is important is to look at the simplification of an implosion where instead of having a, a complicated spherical implosion, you just look at two pistons surrounding a hot plasma. You write down Newton's laws for each of these pistons. So F equals MA. They have some initial velocity. They come together and, and hit each other, squeezing up the gas inside. If the pistons are symmetric, uh, there's no net center of mass motion because they, they come in with the same momentum. They uh, squeeze up the gas. Kinetic energy is converted into internal energy and they stop. But if they're asymmetric, there's a net center of mass motion. And uh, because of conservation of momentum, you the kinetic energy associated with that center of mass motion never goes away. And so if you go through the, the freshman physics to, uh, or to, to evaluate this uh, system, you find that the pressure in the implosion is again related to the mass of the pistons, the velocity squared, so the, the kinetic energy, the minimum volume that that gas is squeezed up to, but there's this wasted kinetic energy that is related to the center of mass velocity squared over the implosion velocity squared, and that's that's the residual kinetic energy. Now, why this model is interesting, it looks very oversimplified, but it matches our simulations and data very well. So it allows one to kind of understand what are the key parameters and why understand why asymmetry is so important. That's a 1D uh, sort of uh, picture of asymmetry. You can uh, extend that to three dimensions. The physics actually ends up this being the same, even though there's no net center of mass motion. You can imagine a configuration of multiple pistons. In this case, the weighted harmonic mean of the shell aerial density ends up being the key parameter, and that also matches our simulations very well. So you can see as you get implosions that look more and more asymmetric, that kinetic energy or that residual kinetic energy uh, just continues to go up, and that that's basically wasted energy, and energy is precious. Okay, uh, we actually had some idea of some of the levers that, that are important for controlling asymmetry in uh, an indirect drive uh, <coughs> ICF experiment. Beam pointing, which is illustrated here on the left, where you have a hall ROM with our capsule inside and you have laser beams coming in and hitting the wall in different positions, allowed us to have some um, control over the X-ray flux that the capsule sees. And let's blow that up. And that was the primary way uh, that ICF uh, designers and workers have controlled symmetry and implosions for many decades. What we learned during this period, though, during 2015 to 2018, <clears throat> is that 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 beam pointing control of asymmetry is not sufficient in itself. Uh, in particular, the outer beams from the NIF hitting uh, the uh, outer section of the hall ROM wall would create a plume of plasma. 
that plume of plasma would uh, move into the hall rom and intersect the inner beams where that we're trying to deposit here closer to the implosion and thus the energy would not end up going where we want it so there were two key realizations during this 2015 to 2018 period that allowed us to understand what has been frustrating our symmetry control and then gave us a, a, a better ability to control it. One is this uh, asymmetry model uh, due to Callahan and Joe Ralph, uh, where it was recognized what the key parameters controlling uh, low mode asymmetry were. I'm going to uh, mode two in particular, which is uh, the, the most uh, primitive uh, asymmetry of either being a pancake or a sausage implosion. Uh, we found out that. Uh, that symmetry control was influenced by the energy that goes into the picket incident on the inside of the wall here, the spot size on the inside of the wall, the gas density inside the hall ROM, the duration of the laser pulse, the radius of the hall ROM, the radius of the capsule, and the radius of the hall ROM again. And if you, you plot all our data against that parameter, all our data basically collapsed on one curve. So this gives you a way to design uh, roughly uh, an implosion where you have some hope of controlling asymmetry. The other key uh, tool uh, developed during this period uh, was uh, the recognition or the proof that cross-beam energy transfer that had been used previously in high gas filled hall ROMs also worked in low gas filled hall ROMs. And this basically is a, a process where you, you're uh, leveraging a laser plasma instability to shift energy from one set of beams to the others in this uh, section where the beams cross. And that's very effective at taking energy and putting it into the beam that's losing energy due to this plasma and forcing more energy in that direction. And the uh, initial set of experiments were done by Annie uh, Kreitscher uh, on, uh, on that. And it was followed up by some additional experiments by Louisa Pickworth and, her, uh, and the team that I actually called the Hybrid C team. Okay, so now with that understanding of better symmetry control in hand, uh, we, we thought we could now really tackle this hybrid strategy. And so we did scale up the, uh, the capsule radius and uh, it didn't work. So uh, it didn't work nearly as well as we thought. So those are the red and purple points. Uh, we attempted to uh, use the strategy of getting more energy into the hotspot by increasing the, the mass or the size of the, uh, the capsule. Uh, and we thought we can control the symmetry, but it didn't, it struggled initially. And so the yields really didn't go up that much. The pressures were actually even lower uh, than the earlier set of experiments. And so we were struggling. One of the things that surprised us was that the targets quality, the capsules in particular, uh, got worse uh, when we scaled the capsules up. And that was kind of the opposite of our expectation because you would think defects basically say, stay the same size. When you make the system bigger, in a relative sense, the defects are less impactful, but that didn't happen in this case. So there are a number of problems that we identified in the capsule. So again, here's our, our capsule, which is an HDC high density carbon ablator. What we found that there were a bunch of voids and particles in the through thickness of the capsule. There were problems with pits on the surface of the capsule. There were sometimes big holes uh, in the through thickness of the capsule. And uh, all those are seeds for Rayleigh-Taylor instability because again, any little perturbation is amplified by acceleration. And here's a little movie of, uh, of what happens. You can actually see a hydro feature that was seeded by these features entering our hotspot. And uh, that's a problem uh, because there's usually more than one and I'll explain in a moment why that's damaging. So the reason why uh, having those defects in the capsules is damaging is because they cause what we call mixing, which is the injection of high Z material into our low Z plasma, and that costs us energy. So if you uh, look at uh, a cartoon of our implosion here on the right, we have a high density shell that we're trying to surround the hotspot with. 
And if it's just DT, you have a competition between alpha heating, uh, getting the plasma hotter, uh, thermal conduction, cooling it off, and BREMS losses, which are X-ray losses, uh, cooling it off. Now, the issue with BREMS is that uh, the X-ray losses go up as a rapid power of uh, atomic number. In particular, it goes up as the, the square of the average atomic number. So where you might have had a DT plasma, which has a Z bar of one, in the nominal case, as soon as you inject higher Z material, such as carbon or, or higher mat uh, Z mat materials like uh, tungsten, into the hot spot, it causes it to radiate like mad. And that steals energy from the system. And as I tried to emphasize earlier in the talk, energy is precious because we get hardly anything into the fusion fuel by the nature of an ICF system. So we really can't afford to lose any energy. So if you now look at uh, a model of what happens to the fusion yield amplification as a function of kinetic energy, if you had a case where you didn't have any mix and you got to a certain level of kinetic energy and you get this explosive increase in yield, that this, 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 uh, kink upwards is basically ignition. But now you take that system and you inject mix into it because you don't have perfect control of the targets um, or you don't have perfect control of the physics. That moves this, this ignition curve to the right in energy. And uh, that's an energy cost that uh, you may or may not be afford, uh, able to, to pay. In particular, the scaling here uh, shows that the uh, the kinetic energy shifting to the right goes as the, the Z bar to the 0.6 power, which is kind of interesting. So that tells you the cost of mix, and uh, it's a cost we usually can't afford. But in this particular case, and of the experiment of last month, after years of effort by the laser engineering team, we actually got more energy from the NIF. Uh, and it's something that was planned back in like 2015 or 2016. It goes back quite a ways. Uh, but we were able to only implement it and try it out this year. So they were able to move the peak laser energy of the National Ignition Facility to from 1.9 megajoules to 2.05 megajoules. That's enabling the most recent success. So again, so here's our neutron yield versus temperature, neutron yield versus hotspot pressure, and the more recent, the most recent experiment from last month with all the press is this one that's kind of shown in the bullseye, but there was uh, some other experiments shown here as well. So we're finally able to get uh, the yields well above uh, megajoule. Again, the most recent one uh, is three megajoules. And uh, it took this 10 years of effort uh, by addressing problems in steps, building our understanding, using kind of basic principle ideas, a lot of computer simulation. Uh, and it's coupled with a lot of work on the design optimization and trying to finesse things in a regime where, you know, mother nature uh, is working against you. Uh, and that's pretty exciting. Okay, so the uh, the concept that uh, has resulted in kind of the most rec uh, the the series of breakthrough results over the last uh, couple of years is what we call the hybrid E. Where there was a hybrid B, C, D, and E. Uh, so it's the hybrid E, which has been uh, the one that's kind of gotten uh, kind of the pinnacle of all of this understanding put into it. So we've obtained burning plasmas and ignition in the laboratory using this design. In a, in a rust sense, it looks the same as those cartoons uh, of ICF designs from, from many years ago. Yeah, it's still a hall room with a capsule in it, but it's really the details of the dimensions of all of this and the laser pulse that really have made it work. So the key elements have been a uh, 20% larger capsule radius than the previous uh, diamond ablator designs. Uh, a reduced LEH size, again, that LEH is the laser entrance hole for better X-ray confinement with the symmetry control physics understanding that I was talking about a few slides back using cross beam energy transfer and trying to, to use the pointing as best as we could. And that understanding of uh, the gold bubble frustrating our symmetry control. Uh, lowering the peak laser power, but extending the duration of peak power using that coast time physics uh, was key, and all of this uh, resulted in increasing the hotspot energy and pressure and pushing us uh, well past uh, what's required by the loss and criterion to, uh, for ignition. Uh, so the, the most recent result, uh, again, the one from last month, in particular implemented an 8% thicker ablator, again, increasing the mass of the shell with uh, the corresponding 8% more laser energy 
that uh, was mentioned uh, a moment ago, and improving the symmetry or controlling the symmetry. And that uh, took the, res uh, the previous record of 1.37 megajoules to 3.15 megajoules. And here's a three-dimensional neutron image from the previous record shot from uh, it's uh, August 8th, 2021, uh, shown here. And uh, the same sort of neutron image uh, from a month ago is shown here. And you can kind of see, you don't have to be an expert. That's better symmetry. And, uh, you know, it had more energy in the hot spot because of the, the thicker shell. All right, so the, the corresponding laser pulse that goes with this uh, thicker shell is shown here on the left. So I'm overlaying the two laser pulses, again, from the previous record shot, 210808, shown in red. And uh, the the most recent shot, 221204, uh, in blue. And again, it's the basically the same dura same peak power, but just an extending the duration of of peak power a bit. That's really the only change. Uh, although there's some details here that experts can see, but it, it's that's the significant change here. So if you look in loss in parameter space, a so pressure times confinement time versus temperature, uh, that most recent shot is shown over here with a P tau of about 50 atmosphere seconds and 12 uh, uh, keV temperature, and the previous record is uh, here. So we basically push the temperature up uh, through this uh, strategy. And you can see this whole this whole talk has been a story of, of making success, not by revolutionary improvements, but by incremental evolutionary improvements, where we, we, we take a step, we falter, we learn from that, and we take another step forward and we were able to basically climb our way up towards the ignition boundary and then pass through it. So, uh, almost done. So one outstanding remain, one outstanding problem remains or one significant outstanding problem remains that uh, is gonna need to be addressed in order to get the uh, significantly more uh, fusion yield and that is this issue that's been plaguing us for a decade of uh, compression. So uh, if we look at our database of experiments, we've always had a problem of our computer models predicting more compression uh, than we actually observe in reality. And so this plot here illustrates this problem. Uh, this, is a met this is a complicated axis, but this is basically measured compression here on the y-axis and the expected compressibility based on the entropy or the adiabat on the x-axis. Uh, theory line shown in black, and you can see most of our data falls below that theory line. So we usually don't get the amount of compression that we expect, and that, that uh, has been frustrating. The reason why it's so important is the burn efficiency of an ICF plasma is related to the fuel rho R. And the fuel row R is directly related to your ability to compress the plasma. So if you are limited in your ability to compress, you will always be limited in terms of the burn efficiency. So this is uh, a problem that we need to address. Nevertheless, we've gotten ignition and uh, again, greater than unity uh, bypassing this problem for now. So I'd say this is like the end of the beginning. There's more work to do. This is actually just one of many uh, things we want to explore going forward. But it's remarkable now that we can talk about burning plasmas, ignition, and scientific break even in the past tense. You know, it's kind of funny because uh, the, the, the joke about uh, fusion always being 20 years away. And uh, I'll just uh, read through this again. There were no mystery uh, physics opticals standing in the way of ignition uh, or gain. Our theoretical predictions of uh, the physics parameters regime where ignition was expected to occur is consistent with our results. Uh, additional laser energy was was really key, uh, and it's very beneficial. And the implosion physics ended up being more sensitive to the engineering control of the laser and targets than originally thought. So that that's why we had so much uh, effort to make things work. And so far, the, the you know very high compression target designs have not worked as expected. So that's a primary focus of research uh, in the future. Uh, all the breakthroughs that we have made have basically used low gain designs. So with that, I'll stop and I hope uh, my time is good. Uh, yeah, I, okay. So, uh, Mateo, are you? Uh, or... Omar, Hello? thank you. Yeah, very okay. much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a great excellent explanation of how energy gain was achieved. And it is also exciting to be here with the experts 
who made this breakthrough happen. So we have about 11, 10 minutes left for Q and A. Um, here come some of the questions. Um, I'll actually just start with a very basic one first before I go to the question box. Should I leave the slides up by the way, or? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. All so right. maybe in case you wanna to refer to it, but All right. have, have you tried, has your team tried or are there plans to try to reproduce the ignition shot? Annie or Alex, do you want to take that one? Uh... Yeah, I, I can I can speak to that. So, um, of course, we will try to reproduce the level of performance. Um, you know, there are always uh, challenges and things that can go wrong on any particular shot. So we can't quite say when that will be. Um, we're still limited in how many of the uh, 2.05 megajoule laser shots that we can do um, for now about once a quarter. So the next one of those will be coming up in uh, February. Okay, so coming up next month then. Um, as we do have, or as speakers and panelists come on to answer, you can also turn on your camera so we can see you. Um, one question we have here about the indirect drive. Is it using a gold hull room and is it suitable for a potential reactor power plant design? So what happens with the gold hull room doing, during a shot? Um, I think this could also be a design question. So um, furthermore, do you need to go back to the direct drive working on the center tree again? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, it is a goal. <laughs> oh. um, and if you could turn on your camera. Great. Thank you. Can you see me here or yeah. can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, um, I can see you. <laughs> It is a gold hall room uh, that we're using here in these experiments. There are concepts for reactor designs that both use direct drive and also some that use indirect drive. Um, so that both of those are being looked at. And the question as to what happens to the gold during the shot, it's totally obliterated. Okay, great. Thanks, Annie. And um, going to lasers, um, how much is the uncertainty in the timing between all lasers? Can you get the lasers sufficiently synchronized or is there room to improve? I'll take that one. Uh, there is definitely room to improve. And in terms of accuracy being delivered to the target from a timing standpoint, we are in the realm of tens of picoseconds. So it's a extremely precise timing but the team is investigating um, ways to make it even more precise. Thank you. Um, and for Omar, we have a question. Have non-thermal distribution of the fusing nuclei had a significant role? Yeah, that's a, that's a okay. I, I kind of, I, I think I know who the speaker, the questioner is. Uh, they don't, they don't have a significant role. They have a, a definitely there's a signature of non-thermal uh, particles and actually Dave Schlossberg can actually follow up on this question too. I believe in terms of the fusion yields, say for the recent shot, uh, we are quoting a 3.15 megajoule fusion yield. That includes subtracting out the contribution from the part of the plasma that we think is non-thermal, which I believe was about 50 kilojoules of the 3.15 megajoules was was non-thermal. So there is definitely a signature of non-thermal, but we think it's a minor contribution. Dave, do you want to follow up on that and correct me if I've misstated something? Uh, Omar, you got it, you got it right. Um, okay. <laughs> as, as we've climbed higher and higher in performance, we've some of the diagnostics have started to see hints of a small population of non-thermal um, ions in the distribution. Um, but as Omar, Omar mentioned at the, at the moment, I think it's a small effect, but it's an exciting effect to investigate and see. So we're going to continue to do that. Okay, and I'd also like to follow up on that on another question um, about laser systems. This might go to you, Jean Michel. Um, how do you increase um, or how do you get more energy from a laser? You mentioned there is an increase from 1.9 to 2.05 megajoules. It's an excellent question. It's, uh, we have been constantly increasing since the commissioning of NIF, the delivered energy and power. So it's not something we have done overnight. Uh, um, you know, 
Omar mentioned the fact that we have been working on that over many years, which is absolutely true. So to get to your point, the way that you get to increase the laser energy um, is to play on multiple parameters. First of all, we are minimizing losses um, in the UV laser as well as in the infrared section of the laser. It goes with developing new coatings, new technology to make that possible. Then second, we also investing a lot in material uh, resistance, material fabrication processes to make those optics hardened and more sustainable uh, to take shots at higher fluences without incurring damage. And then last but not least, what we do is we're working on all aspects of the beam, we're shaping our beam in time, as Omar indicated, to achieve the epics, but we're shaping them in frequency as well and in space. So we are flattening the beam as much as possible so for a given laser aperture, you can truly optimize uh, the delivered energy without having hot spots that would compromise the uh, integrity of the optics. And, and could this? We're, we're about to increase by yet an additional uh, 8%, uh, going from one, you know, 1 1.9 to 205 megajoule was 8%, mm -hmm. as Omar mentioned, but we're about to increase yet by another 8% over the summers, which will provide more margin for ignition experiment. And could this increase, could this have happened already 10 years ago or why now? Well, it's a combination, as I said, of, um, you know, technology improvements, uh, mm -hmm. investment interest, you know, um, and the momentum that we have behind us. But we have been working on that for years. I mean, we have a couple of paper, 2019 nuclear fusion, uh, explain how we did it. Excellent. Um, and this is a general overall question we've also had in our chat, but what needs to be done to scale up laser based fusion and perhaps for the future of fusion energy being a commercial product. Well, um, uh, <laughs> you know, our facility is a research facility. We're not a uh, fusion reactor. Uh, I think there's a number of things that have to be done on the laser and the targets. The targets in particular, I'm wondering if maybe a boss, you might be able to expound on the target needs uh, to make uh, IFE practical. <laughs> yeah, just in very simple terms, we need to shoot at about a million times a day. And at this point, we shoot about one time a day. And that is, it's actually that one time is a culmination of about seven days of trying to get the DT fuel into an ice form. So as Alex and Omar and company would say, we wish we could do it more often, but that's what the facility can do at this point. So there has to be major engineering advances to be able to make these targets at that rate, which basically becomes 10 times a second and be able to shoot the laser that many times and deal with, you know, all the the, the 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 hot stuff in the chamber and so on. So there's a lot of studies on that, by the way. And like Jean Michel said, it's uh, lots of papers on that from from the past, and that work is beginning to be ramped up again. But the targets is one challenge: the laser shooting ten times a second. And, and then in the physics side, I think we need a gain of about a hundred or so mm -hmm. to make this thing work. So we got another two orders of magnitude to go. <laughs> And also make the laser more efficient because, as Omar pointed out, such that there is no confusion, we drew about 300 to 400 megajoule out of the electrical grid. And NIF was not designed to be energy efficient, it was designed to demonstrate scientific break even. But we know now how to make laser way more efficient at the tune of 10 to 20 percent wall plug efficiency. So we would need this type of lasers firing at 10 hertz or so to make it uh, viable. Thank you. Um, we do have a few minutes left. I really want to thank you, the panelists, and Owen for the presentation and hand it over back to Matteo. Joanne, well, since uh, we have one minute left, I'll, I'll take this time. I have two questions. <laughs> I wanted to ask, uh, I, 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 I listened to the, to the live streaming of the announcement and uh, could you, maybe it was Annie, I think, who answered this question. Could you tell us about how, like, what was the process of, I know you used AI machine learning for some of the design uh, for fine tuning. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what went into this 
Yeah, um, so I can sort of walk you through. Um, in this case, we didn't actually use AI to design the experiment, but after we had already determined the design parameters, we used AI to uh, provide a probability distribution uh, for achieving gain. Um, so the process that goes into this, uh, like many other things has been a culmination of years of building up understanding and developing models and cross-checking those models against experimental data, um, both analytical models as well as uh, complex rad hydro, uh, radiation hydrodynamic simulations. So over many, many years, we've been uh, calibrating our understanding to our experimental data and then using those calibrated models to make design improvements. So uh, specifically going into this regime, I used a combination of analytical scaling, semi-analytical models, radiation hydrodynamic simulations, and uh, that's how I determined, for example, how much thicker to make the target with the, with the given laser energy um, upgrade, as well as figuring out how to fix the asymmetry. Um, and so that's quite a complicated process, and we do rely on uh, our scalings and also on our uh, simulation tools to do that because you have basically laser beams propagating through um, plasma that's expanding at, at a different rate into the hall room. And so trying to get a symmetric radiation drive at the percent level is quite challenging. So we, we do need to use a combination of of many tools. So I set the design parameters, and then I worked with our AI team to, uh, they took that information and came up with an independent assessment for, uh, they confirmed what I had predicted is that we would uh, achieve gain more than one. And they also confirmed that and put a probability distribution to it. Thanks, Annie, very interesting. And I uh, just one last question, we're one minute late. Uh, maybe Omar, this can be quick. I think it's for you. It sounded like the physics of the cost time was, was a real game changer. Is that it, it, it was significant. Uh, the the funny thing about the coast time was it's it's not something that's common knowledge in ICF. So is it was uh, it took some understanding to realize how important it was. So it was something that people thought were was minor that actually ended up being a, a major uh, factor. But uh, one of the points I tried to make in the talk, it's ICF is no one thing. It's it's all of these elements have to come together uh, to get uh, ignition on, in an ICF target to work. So, uh, and you have to be lucky that they all work correctly at the same time. So, uh, so, so yes, coast time is important. Uh, it was neglected largely uh, before we understood it better, but it's one of many things that uh, uh, has to be rolled in together to make this work. Okay, thank you all very much. This was fantastic to have you all here. Uh, thank you for this one hour. Congratulations again for this extraordinary results. Uh, thank you, Joanne. <laughs> so we'll try to make this uh, recording available after, uh, of course, doing the, the checks with, uh, with the NIF and the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. But if we do make it available, we will announce it to all the registered participants. And uh, we let you know for the about the next episodes in this uh, fusion breakthrough series. So thank you for staying with us and thank you for the for attending to all the panelists. Thank you for uh, your invitation to speak and thanks to my colleagues for taking the time this morning <laughs> to, to be online. Uh, okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.